In life, they're magic. They're golden because they lived, we had new dreams. John Lennon helped us imagine. Elvis asked only love me tender. And for millions of viewers, newscaster Jessica Savage was truly a golden girl. But in death, their lives have taken on a whole new dimension. In shocking detail now, we hear tales of bizarre sex, sordid drug habits, personal degradation, and mental illness. But who will defend the dead? Those who love them, family, friends, fans, wonder if there are any limits on the parade to the cash register because they know that scandal sells. And for people like John Lennon's former mistress, May Pang, who told all about loving John just a few years back. Alana Nash, whose tell-all biography on Jessica Savage has inspired Jessica's family to accuse her of grave robbing. And this woman, who joins us via satellite, Gloria Brewer Georgia, who has had the audacity to suggest that Elvis Presley's very death was a hoax. Are there no limits about what can be written about the dead? When a star is gone, it's open season as Digging the Dirt on the Dead is our focus on this edition of Geraldo. You know, I wonder, I wonder if it isn't some weird ultimate index of stardom, a star's final measure of real glamour, real clout, the measure of earning power from even beyond the grave as book after book, headline after headline reveal secrets we, the buying public, seem dying to learn. But how much of a star's weaknesses do we really want to know? Take a look. Thank you very much, everyone. They were the celebrities we loved to love or the celebrities we loved to hate. When they were alive, there was nothing they could do that was too ordinary, too predictable, too staged. We kissed their hems and screamed our approval or our disapproval whenever we got the chance. They were so unlike us, seemed so immortal. Coming from them, talk of death seemed almost frivolous, though in some cases it would prove to be prophetic. Dear Mr. Lemon, from information I received while using a Ouija board, I believe that there will be an attempt to assassinate you. The spirit that gave me this information was Brian Epstein. <laughs> Tragically, many of the famous die young and were shocked into mourning, almost as if we had lost a close personal friend. But unlike our friends, most of us never really knew the celebrities who've passed away so publicly. Our final images of their lives are their obituaries that we've seen on the evening news. So many of us are left wondering, did these people live as dramatically as they died? Actress Natalie Wood drowned in these waters one night after dining on this boat with her movie star husband and their movie star friend. Jessica Savage, the golden girl of TV news, drowned in this canal along with her newspaper executive friend and her dog when their car took a wrong turn. Comedian John Belushi overdosed in an exclusive Hollywood hotel in the company of this woman. She was later convicted for her role in causing his death. These facts raise many titillating questions. And to those of us who want every sordid secret detail of how they live, the bare facts are not enough. So we buy books to tell us more. The secret lives, the untold stories, the inside scoop. Now, in fairness, many of these celebrity biographies are pretty well researched. They are based on fact. Others, though, are just digging up dirt on the dead. To friends and family, it ranges from slander to grave robbing. But to the buying public, too much is never enough, and no one is immune. Not even Pablo Picasso, an institution, perhaps the greatest painter of our time. Now, 15 years after his death, a bestseller threatens to eclipse these memories of the artist. As aggressively stated on the cover of the book, the legendary painter was, quote, unable to love and was driven to dominate and humiliate the women and the many men who fell under his hypnotic spell. But even beyond this, beyond the books, are the films based on the books, based on the lives of the departed celebrities. In this case, John Belushi. These scenes are from the making of Wired, based on Bob Woodward's book of the same name. <laughs> Well, you know, every time I wear this outfit, I think of what Mae West once said. Too much of a good thing is wonderful. <laughs> Liberace fans obviously Thank agree. You. After well, his death due to AIDS, it was open gentlemen. season on the poor man's alleged promiscuity and proclivity for young men. So hungry are we for every last sordid detail. The networks are treating us to not just one, but two made-for-TV biographies to air within a week of each other. 
And then there was or is Elvis, Elvis Presley, who we buried, grieved, commemorated, impersonated, memorialized, and biographized. In some ways, Elvis has probably never been so alive. In fact, the truly greedy claim he never died. John Lennon also lives in Imagine, a new film from Warner Brothers. Its release is well-timed, following as it does on the muddy heels of a book which alleges Lennon suffered from everything from drug to wife abuse. Yoko is also severely criticized, but she at least is alive to defend herself. Were you ever the Dragon Lady? Um, Dragon Lady. <laughs> well, I don't know what Dragon Lady means, but Dragon probably um, symbolizes something that is unique and very strong, and if that's what it is, uh, I'm honored. But after all the controversy has calmed and the charges are forgotten, there will always be John's music. John Lennon. While Albert Goldman's controversial best-selling biography is told from the outside of John's life looking in, an insider, John's former mistress, May Pang, has given the world her version of John in her book of some years ago called Loving John. May, welcome. Thank you. You know, we uh, go back a long way. Yes, we do. So to speak. We met, uh, I guess, back in 1971, 1972. That 71. Um, 71, 72. you were working for John. I was friendly with him. He did a benefit concert at my urging, etc. I remember when your book came out, uh, your book about your affair with John. I remember being very angry at you because at that time there had been... Goldman's book obviously wasn't out yet. There was the public's image of John. There was Strawberry Fields, the park dedicated to his memory in Central Park. There uh, were other kinds of testimonials to the man's greatness, to his music. And what you wrote about was something else. You wrote about a very fragile man, a man who had some real problems. Um, wh why did you do it? Why did you tell that story? I told that story only because I got tired of other people writing about our situation, our affair as you call it, um, it was so different. He was not always drunk, and I had to explain that. And, you know, at that time, you talk about his frailties. Well, he was in the papers talking in his drunken stupor. People, all the media just blew it out of proportion. So I got tired of seeing all that, and I decided it was time to tell my side of the story. But the portrait that you paint isn't all that flattering. You talk about John's warts, so to speak, as well as uh, his obvious greatness. Yeah, well... Everybody's human, and he has his faults, and he also has his greatness. And in the book, it shows both sides. Was he, as Albert Goldman alleges, a homosexual? Well, not to my knowledge. If you know, he wasn't. He was a. To me, he was a great lover. So you had a, a normal kind of <laughs> sexual relationship. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, he had no tendencies, homosexual tendencies, when I was with him. Let's put it that way. Was he? as Goldman alleges, a heroin addict. Well, I know that he had taken heroin before when I first met them, him and Yoko, um, in the early um, 70, but not during my time. Now, afterwards, I don't know. When we split up, I have no idea. I guess the third uh, most sensational charge involves the uh, statement by Albert Goldman that John was anorexic. Well, I did see John in 1978. And when he did come over to my apartment, he was a bit thin. He was about 135 pounds, but he told me that he was on a macrobiotic diet. 135 pounds? Mm -hmm. He was a bit taller than I... I five foot 11. 11. Mm -hmm. uh, 135 pounds. He was always thin, but he had a pot belly. Yes. Right? He couldn't get rid of that. That's the one thing he did say. But he definitely wasn't anorexic. No, I mean, I, don't, I didn't see him as an anorexic. I did see him very thin. And he told me that he took a he was on a macrobiotic diet and he lost weight. He was always conscious of his weight. Is it true that Yoko arranged your affair with John? Yes, it's true. She sat me down in the office one day and she said, we're having problems, which everybody in the house, in, you know, who was working for them knew. And we were sitting there uh, together and she looked over at me. She goes, well, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, John's going to start seeing other people because we're not getting along. And I just stared at her and I said, yes. And I'm thinking, who am I going to be working for, him or her? And next thing you know, she said, well, you know, I know that he likes you. 
And I said, excuse me? And she said, I know he likes you, and I know you're going to be good for him. I said, but I don't want your husband. She said, that's okay. I know you're not, you're not wanting it. You don't want him, but uh, it's okay. I think you'll be good for him. You didn't love John. Not at the time. I loved him as a person. I liked him as a person. Everybody okay? loved him as a person. Right, but... You had no romantic feelings for John. No, not at all. And yet you agreed to accept this relationship. No, I didn't agree at first. John, in the end, pursued me. And his charm won me over. Within a relatively short time, Meg, right. you agreed to be John's girlfriend, mistress, whatever you call it. He took me out on a date. That's basically how it starts. And we did live together separately away from the household. And he did it with the advice and consent of his wife. Right. So you accepted, in essence, the position of what? what uh, his American geisha? No. Because I did it for love. I mean, that was, I wasn't paid. Now. What? How could you say you did it for love when you what? didn't love John? Because by the time you go out with somebody, you go out with them, you don't fall in love with somebody on the first date. But May, would you have gone with, uh, all right, here, this, okay. this is his wife. She says, uh, you go with my husband. He works in uh, the electronics industry. You wouldn't go with the uh, electrician or the electrical engineer. You went because it was John Lennon. That's not true. Uh, hold on, that's not true. Because if I wanted John, this was like, a, we're talking, if I wanted John, I was working for him for three years. I had no desires. I had no desires at all. But that's all. my point. I had no desires. But he then, I did not know that he liked me. That's what I found out. Did happened. John like you or was John like you following Yoko's orders? No, he liked me because Yoko he told... knew mm -hmm. that John was is going to start fooling around on her. Right. Yoko knew she could control you. That's true. Yoko picked the safe choice. Here, John, go have some fun with May, knowing that she could reel him back in anytime she wanted. Well, if you're talking about reeling him back in, it didn't take, it took a long time. We lived together for a year and a half. But ultimately, he went home. He went home, ultimately, but we never stopped our relationship. Are you saying the affair continued after John went back with you? We remained friends, and we were very close, even up until the time he died. You can tell us more about the relationship. We'll meet the woman who has written a very controversial biography of the newswoman, Jessica Savage. We'll meet the other lady who says that Elvis lives in Kalamazoo at the Burger King. <laughs> and we'll deal with digging up dirt on the dead after this break. Welcome back. Digging up dirt on the dead, our focus. Alana Nash has just written Golden Girl. It's this year's second biography on the late Jessica Savage. Alana's book prompted Jessica's sister, Lori, to write to our staff. Let me quote here. Geraldo's a famous person. I hope he has no enemies, and I hope he lives forever. If not, his loved ones might have to endure the pain my family has faced at the hands of grave robbers who pose as authors. End quote. Among those enduring pain in the wake of uh, Golden Girl, this book, meet Maury Levy. He is a Philadelphia marketing executive who says he was one of Jessica's closest friends for many years, right up to the time of her death. Alana, why did you write this book? I really admire Jessica Savage. I was influenced by her. She was a role model for my generation. I thought she was terrific. You wrote it because you admired her. Still do. Admire her more now than when I started. I took notes when I read your book. And this is the portrait of Jessica that emerged to me. A compulsive, driven woman, uncomfortable with her Judaism, into a psychic phenomenon, a pothead, later a coke freak, who atol attempted suicide many times. She was getting coke from some unnamed convict source. She had multiple abortions. She was mean, aloof, psychotic, hanging out with lesbian cokeheads uh, after two failed marriages, the second of which ended when her husband killed himself. It doesn't sound like you admire her. She wasn't mean. <laughs> I wouldn't say she was mean. Well, throughout the book it says how incredibly mean she was to subordinates, how impossible to deal with. I mean, it is a scathingly negative portrayal. It's a, it's a portrait of, of a woman who was troubled and who desperately wanted to be perfect. And if she saw any flaws in herself or flaws in people around her, she reacted very harshly. But it all came from pain and from striving for perfection. Do you believe, Alana, that there are any limits, any rules, 
whatsoever in chronicling the life of a famous person. Absolutely. There's a lot of things I didn't put in here. God, I can't believe that. It's true. What it's true. could you possibly it's have true. left out? She had well, sex with Elvis. Oh, with Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> in Kalamazoo. Yeah. No. You read the book, Mom? Yeah, unfortunately, I read the book. And your reaction as someone who knew her? Uh, Lori's right. You know, this woman is a Lori, grave robber. Lori right. Savage is right. I mean, this woman is a grave robber. Um, it's very creepy. Uh, did you ever meet her? No. Yeah, well. I wish I had. Yeah, you wish, wish you would admire her. She needed friends like you. Um, she needed friends like you. See, I wish yeah. you had talked to me. I wish the right. family had talked to me. Right, but and the book refused. would have been a lot different, right? Well, from what you say. Let me, let me tell you the way I read the book. I've, I've had a copy of it. It's not, I don't think it's, is it out yet? No. Yeah. Yeah, you're I've had a copy of it for a couple of months because a friend of mine who is an executive at one of the movie studios passed it on to me because the book is being shopped around to be a movie. Book which will bring even, well, la di da, which will bring even more money. <laughs> And, you know, that's the whole point of this. It's not, gee, Jessica Savage is a wonderful person. I admire her. I think I'll write a book about her. I got the same offers. I turned them down. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there was a woman who read the news on television. There was a woman who was my friend and Lori's sister. And that person was a private person. Uh, we don't have to go into all the specifics of this. Go, go into this specific. Was she, as Alana alleges, a totally out of control drug-addicted, uh, psychotic person? No. Uh, let me give you one piece of information. G give me a piece of find. misinformation. Where is yeah, the book well, that you won't find in the book. You know, there, there's, there's tons of stuff in the book about cocaine, about this, about different, about different problems she had. One problem that's not, that's not in there at all is the fact that, and I know this because I went to the doctor with her in Philadelphia when she first started out, um, she had something called a floppy mitro valve, which I won't go into because I'm not a doctor, but very simply, it's a heart problem that meant if she took any kind of medicine that had, that had any kind of speed, whatever in it, she would have been dead long before that car crash in New Hope. Where was that in the story? It's called Where was that in the book? Prolapse. Yeah, was it in the book? Alana? It's mitral valve prolapse. It's not that serious. It's not actually even a heart problem. It's, it's a very common uh, heart is valve it, disorder. Is it conceivable that a person with this heart valve disorder could indulge in cocaine to the extent that you portray in the book? I don't know. A that, cocaine I don't know. pig. I don't know. She's not a cocaine pig. What? I, no. I read one page, I remember, an unnamed source saying that he carried $75,000 right. worth of cocaine into right. Jessica's home or office, I don't recall exactly. Well, where she going. would go in with other people to buy it. It wasn't all for her. There were times when she was very, very active in her cocaine use, and other times Help. she wasn't using it at all. See, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I, I spent, before I got into marketing, I spent many years as a print journalist. And we had lawyers, and, and I won a lot of awards, not as many as you perhaps, but I won a lot of awards for investigative reporting. We had lawyers who would not let us say anything like this about someone living unless we had sources to corroborate it. Uh -huh, Many but, sources to corroborate it. But there's it. the rub. But there's the rub. She's no, not living. She's not living. Right. Well, now I open a book, and anybody here can open a book, and read, well, here's one guy. Now, I happen to know all, the, all these people. Here's one guy from Philadelphia who decides, hey, this is neat. She's dead. I'll say I had an affair with her. Not only does he tell her that he had an affair with her, but goes into every gory, seamy detail of this thing that he made up in his head. Corroboration? Why? She's dead. She just prints this crap. Period. Your response, Alana? There were other sources for that. He oh, yeah. There must have been people in the bedroom, right? All the people with the coat. They brought it in and they sat there and watched, right? <laughs> Let's take our first break. We'll be back. Let's reflect. Digging up dirt on the dead, our focus. We'll be right back. And now, my personal favorite on the trash hit parade. <laughs> now, I mean, Gail Brewer Giorgio, who joins us via satellite from Atlanta. You, like anyone else in this country, have the right to write a book. Your book happens to be, Is Elvis Alive? Now, 
Having said that, and having uh, exalted the First Amendment and believing, as I do, in freedom of speech, all kinds of speech, which includes writing, the thing that really bugs me about this book, and you know what it's about, is, is Elvis Alive, okay, uh, is that I get acknowledged as a source, and I get quoted throughout this thing for my 2020 report on the, uh, the Elvis cover-up on the cause of death. You get quoted, Alana, as a source for saying that, uh, here's a riddle before I get, uh, Gil, I'm going to get right to you. Uh, why did Elvis's coffin weigh 900 pounds? That's the riddle. You want the answer? Because it was Elvis plus a 300 pound air conditioner. It was a wax dummy plus an air conditioner to keep the wax dummy from melting. <laughs> Gail, where'd you get that one from? Well, that was in uh, many of the newsletters. By the way... Wait, uh, wait, wait. What, many of the newsletters? What newsletters? From where? Mars? No. Uh, no, not from Mars. From fan magazines, from fan letters. By the way... That Geraldo, said it was a wax dummy? Yeah, many people... But it wasn't really Elvis's body. It was a wax dummy. Um, by the way, I talked to Alana, and she is a journalist that went by the coffin twice. She told me, and she also told Bill Burke... Um, that she was convinced it was not Elvis in the coffin. I talked to other people. However, as you know from reading my book, by the way, I didn't say Kalamazoo in the book, and you were asking at the beginning of the program... Wait, wait, here's Alana's, here's Alana's quote. I underline. I talked recently to Alana Nash, a journalist who was with the Louisville Courier at the time of Elvis's death. Is that correct? Right. Uh, I'm a logical person, Alana told me. I went to the viewing, actually passed by the coffin twice. I always felt it was a wax dummy. I thought then and still think that Elvis is alive. End quote. I think she misunderstood, though. I, I, for the second, he really, it really did look like a dummy in that coffin. And I thought for a second, maybe, but I don't think so, no. I just, at the moment, I thought, my God, what a wonderful hoax this would be if the guy's alive and that's a dummy. But I don't think he's alive. No. Well, how do you feel about being quoted as the source here? I was, I was surprised at that last line, I must say. That you thought then and still think Elvis is alive? I don't think that. I did the second I passed by the coffin, but I don't now. What, did you give uh, Gail this quote? I don't remember that last line. Yes, we talked for a while. and I, did. I didn't know, uh, you know, if she's changed her mind, that's okay, too. Um, <laughs> Geraldo? Yes, Gail. Uh, okay. Um, what, you had asked some questions at the beginning of the show about how far, and I think it's really interesting, how far should we go in posing questions, perhaps digging up dirt on the dead. I know when you did the cover-up in the death of Elvis, many people were angry at you, a lot of the fans. Um, what is the answer to that question? Really, how far should we go? I mean, what... Do you Let me just say that I am quoted in this book, my report is quoted as lending credence to the theory that Elvis Presley hoaxed his own death. No, I that say That report had nothing whatsoever to do with Elvis not. Presley hoaxing his own death. Rather, excuse me, Gail, it had to do with what we believed and believe that we have proven that the real cause of Elvis's death was not a heart, heart arrhythmia, as was stated officially, but rather that Elvis, like so many other melancholy stories in the business of rock and roll, died from drug abuse. Yes, he and died. I, I held his autopsy in my hand. Yes. I know the man was dead. I can't believe that people would believe well, let me see. Let me see your proof, Gail. Let me see your proof. Convince me. Right. Let me okay. see the picture first. Let's see the. You won't be able to see the photo, but we'll show it for you, Gail, and we'll describe. It. Let's see the photo now of Elvis peeking out from where. Set the scene. What is this now? All right. A Chicago businessman by the name of Mike Joseph went to Graceland four months after the death of Elvis. Um, he took that picture, Geraldo, and didn't notice it. In fact, it's in the bathhouse. Beyond Meditation right, Gardens. Right. That picture was first shown. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see what you're showing. That picture was first shown on KCOP TV in LA right. uh, several years ago. It's a um, UFO. Oh, no, no. It's a, I, I, see, I see it right, right there. Now, how many of you believe that Elvis is still alive based on this photograph, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You also had an audio tape. We'll just we'll run a 40-second excerpt from Gail's audio tape. <laughs> this is Elvis, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it. People ask me all the time when I'm living. Naturally, I can't say, but uh, it's a good place to hide. I really can't say that, that I didn't need to rest. Slowly, I, I started 
started getting myself in shape. I didn't sing much. I needed to rest even more than even more than I knew. But after about a year, uh, I started missing the people and the entertaining. And... Try, try this, try. Well, after about a year, I started missing the people and entertaining and. Uh... Gail. Yes. Come on. Geraldo, do you think I got a group of people in the room and said, how many people here believe it's Elvis, raise your hand, and that was the source of any kind of verification? If you do, uh, you're wrong. How'd you and get by, the tape? By the way, the... wait, wait, by the way, in my book, when I talk about 2020, I say that you were looking into the cover-up of the death related to drugs. I don't say that you were looking in to prove Elvis was alive, and on talk shows, I have never said that. Well, thank you for that. Yes. But the way you build up the evidence is to take people who are engaged in legitimate journalism, quote them totally out of context, and end everything they say. If the autopsy covered up heart arrhythmia, maybe the whole thing was fictional. Do you, Gail, believe Elvis is really alive? The premise of my book, Geraldo, is that... <laughs> let me ask you this. Is it totally... I asked you first. No, wait, I have to ask the question. Is it totally out of the realm of possibility for you? Because you Do are you, mocking. Gail Brewer, George Gill, believe Elvis is still alive? No, but I think the possibility uh, is there. Now, have I seen Elvis? Have I had his child? No. Have, uh, I heard that Elvis was in Kalamazoo at the Burger King with Desiree, his love child. <laughs> you didn't hear that? From, did you hear that from me? You didn't hear that from all right, me. No, all right, wait, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. What do you think about this? I'm having dinner with Buddy Holly after this. So. <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll be right back. I've had, uh, I've had up until this point a relatively colorful life. I just hope that I, for one, outlive you, Alana. <laughs> well, no, you're, you're being unfair. You're being unfair. It's a balanced book. I interviewed 350 people. But what's, what was the balance, though, in the Jessica Savage book? Now, let's get back she to that. She was a good person. I'm but that, that doesn't emerge from a single page that I read there. It doesn't it, say it, she was a bad person. It, it says that she was a, a psychotic, uncontrolled, she wasn't drug psychotic. abusing. She wasn't psychotic. Every single page you have her, like, throwing somebody out of a room or going she through this. She was very histrionic. Or sleeping with this person or doing that or going here. And it's, she uh, was very histrionic. You never talk about her journalism, for example. You never talk about have a lot how of she. <laughs> she didn't. She was, a, she was a brilliant anchor woman, but not a very good journalist. Well, I wanted to ask a question to Ms. Giorgio. Um, I read your book, and I listened to the tape, and... Oh, 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 oh we just lost the, uh, the satellite audio. I'm sorry. So the questions, edit the questions. We'll get back to, uh, is Elvis alive? No, you can finish it later. I'll keep me in suspense. Yeah. No questions for Atlanta yet. We lost the, uh, she can't hear us, but we'll get back. She can hear Elvis, but not us, so... <laughs> my, my question is directed to May, and uh, there's a new movie coming out, I understand, on John Lennon's life. I Won wondered if you've seen it. And, I only uh, saw... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And uh, how much dirt do you feel is in it, especially in regards to yourself? I did it. Uh, they gave me 30 seconds. <laughs> and the only thing I talk about that I did see, and they were kind enough to let me see my segment, was the fact that during the time that John and I were together, he was the most prolific musically. And talk about the time that Paul McCartney used to say, you know, come over to our house, and, and Ringo, and George, and Elton, and Mick, you know, Jagger, um, you know, all those. But, that's, um, that's one thing that uh, I think that may, one point she makes that you have to agree with, they talk about John Lennon's lost weekend. After Yoko arranged this bizarre, or at least the arrangement was bizarre, right. uh, and May and John went off to live on the West Coast, it is generally assumed, because John was caught a couple of times, very drunk in public, right, it's about a couple that of it was times. a lost weekend that lost, lasted 14 months. He was a wild man at the time. Right. He was drinking too much at the time. Right. When you hang out with Harry Nielsen, you don't have much choice here. <laughs> but he was also writing music. Yes, he was doing a lot of music, and that's what the book explains, that he wasn't always drunk, because he was there to do all the music. Hi. Um, uh, there was an article recently in the Newsday, and I was curious. Uh, 
Right. The Newsday had said that you work basically from sunup to sundown, even past that point, seven days a week. And I'm curious, if you did not love John Lennon, why did you work like, like a slave? Or I guess that's a good question. At the time, I was 22. Well, I started with them when I was 20. And I, I loved the idea of working, and music was just my whole life. And working from sun, from sun up to sundown was something that was another experience for me. And I enjoyed it so much that it didn't bother me. But I did work an awful lot and did not get paid for overtime. It was a flat rate. Was Yoko really as intimidating? Was she really the dragon lady? She was very intimidating. I mean, she scared a lot of people in the house. When she said something, everybody just sort of like got quiet and sort of did what they had to do. But you worked around it. And it was fine. She used to call me at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, 6 in the morning, whatever hour. Uh, I've seen the film Imagine. It's an authorized biography, so you don't see the, right. the, a lot of the heavy dirt that you hear in some of the biographies. But I think it's fair and balanced. And there are some beautiful uh, pictures of John. I mean, some, they, they had the camera on them a lot, those two, John and Yoko. And there are some nice scenes that I've never seen before. So I think it's definitely worth seeing. Okay, we'll be right back. More questions for our guests. <laughs> Is it fair to say that your primary source of, for this book was her boyfriend, you say Ron Kershaw? He was one of many. There were about ten primary sources. But he's the one I see quoted most often. Not most often. Please, let me say that as the book, I'm answering the, the one that sticks out in my mind as saying the most salacious things and giving the most incredibly uh, revealing insights into her sordid, allegedly sordid life is Ron Kershaw. I wouldn't agree. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reader of this book, <laughs> I say that Ron Kershaw was a very, very critical source. When did he die? July 3rd. Did Ron Kershaw read the galleys of this no. book? No. Is Ron Kershaw obviously around to say that he really gave you these quotes? He's on tape. All the interviews are on tape. <laughs> was Ron Kershaw as important to Jessica as Alana maintains in this book? Yeah, Ron was very important. Ron and Jessica and my wife and I used to go out a lot together. They'd come over our house for barbecues with the kids and so forth. Uh, kids didn't do much coke. Um, yeah, but you know, but seriously, Ron was a, a very major part of her life. Do you believe he gave these awfully nasty quotes? No. No, it's, it's not like It's easy to prove. He's on tape. Just as the heart malfunction is, the autopsy shows it's a normal heart. You brought up that point. <laughs> May, I'd like to ask May a question. You said your involvement with um, Yoko Lennon, she involved in a, arranged your relationship with John. Mm -hmm. What relationship do you have with Yoko at this time? And also, how do you observe John's death? Hmm. I don't have a relationship with Yoko. I've tried contacting her many times after John had died. She wouldn't return any of my phone calls. In fact, I just recently ran into her in London a week ago or so, and um, I was there and I wanted to say hello to her. I stood in her path and she just looked the other way and was like just a little afraid to even see me. Just walked away. And as far as John's death, it was a sad thing. Um, it's very hard, to, you know, we always, we always hear of John all the time because whether it be for the music or read about him, he's always going to be around, you know. Um, I'd like to ask you, Alana? if, yeah, Alana, if you admire this woman so much, how can you write and print all these things? And I haven't read the book, but I'm going to read the book because from what, what, well, from what you've said, it doesn't sound like, and from what I've hear, what I've heard, and what from what I've heard from you, it doesn't sound like it's real. And I don't know how you can. I don't know how you can. But then why do you want to buy it? But maybe you that's buy the book anyway. See, maybe that's, that's the why they write these books. Because yeah. of this, of the confrontation, the it just it all seems very mixed up. And I don't know how you can write things about people that are so negative about Jessica Savage, how it was so negative, if. If you liked her so much, if you admired her, I just don't understand. Well, that's a good question. But first, to, to tag along something Geraldo said, Ron Kershaw signed a release for that interview, which I have. I had three hoaxers on the program uh, six weeks ago. They signed a release swearing that they were telling the truth. <laughs> and if I catch them, I'm going to... Now listen, 
You're, you're being as heavy-handed as you're accusing me of being. Who's heavy-handed? You are. I didn't say anything about your private life. <laughs> I don't know anything about your private life. Does this that qualify me to write a book about your private life? Maybe. This book is based on 350 interviews with people all through her life. I tried nobody to Nobody in her family. Yeah, several uncles and cousins. The family said oh, they would help come me. On. The family said they would help me More, after their the lawsuit family? was settled. They refused after their lawsuit was settled. Now, uh, I tried to interview this man. That's he wouldn't right. talk. That's right. The family and the close friends all got together. We knew these things, these books are going to be out. This is the second one. And, oh, there's an ad that I saw in the paper today that basically says, buy this one because the other one didn't tell you enough dirt. This has more dirt than the other one, honest. Let me ask uh, you this. If yeah. two authors working independently come to basically the same conclusion, both of them interviewing more than 300 people, how could they come up with the same conclusions if it's not the truth? Same people say Elvis is alive or that UFOs have landed and are raping women. <laughs> That's a good show. Why didn't I, you I know. That's probably nice. Hi. Why didn't you come forward to say some good things about it? This is for uh, Jessica's friend. I'd like yeah. to know: Is there one specific, Maury. Maury, Is there one specific point in the book that you find the most objectionable, or is it the whole good book? Yeah, save it. Think about it. Yeah, yeah. we'll be right yeah. back. Brass tacks, specifically, what do you find most objectionable about her book? Uh, we don't have that much time. Let me just pick one thing. Uh, she was my best friend for um, over a dozen years. And to read a portrait of her as a raving lunatic who was coked out all the time, who, who did crazy things, I, that's not the person I spent all of my time with. That's not the person I knew. And that's not the loving person who was a good journalist and who knew what she was doing. Um, you know, I mean, that's just one of the things. Why didn't I speak out, which has been brought up here? Um, I know how this game works. I've been on the other side of it. And I know how you can interview somebody. And sure, it's on tape. But what about the good stuff? What about the stuff in between? I happen to know, because I had a long conversation with Lori Savage, her sister, before coming in here, that this book isn't even out yet, and there are three or four people who have seen galleys of it who are already have lawyers and are planning to sue because they feel they were misquoted, misrepresented, that what they said was not put in the book as they had said it. So it's bull. I mean, I knew what was going to happen. I caution the family, don't talk because it's only going to be twisted. And in fact, anybody who spoke to her is sort of sitting around now saying, what happened to all the good things I said? Why aren't they in there? Alana, you want to briefly respond? You hear these allegations whenever any biography comes out. You could pick any book off the shelf and you'll hear that. But I can back up anything that's in that book. Well, you might have to. <laughs> okay, Gail. Gail is back. And, uh, Gail, can you hear us okay? Yeah, hello, okay, hold on. I Here's can. a question Thanks. for you. Okay, yeah. Miss Giorgio, I read your book and I listened to your tape, and I must say that it's very easy to believe something like that because it's very romantic, and of course, there's a lot of question and uh, fantasy about it. But in listening to the tape and trying to be very straight headed about it, I wondered why the interviewer was never heard on the tape, only so-called Elvis's remarks, and uh, I wondered what you have to say about that. Yeah, um, I explain in the book uh, about the tape, and by the way, I'm glad you brought it up. I sent that tape to one of the top experts, part of the a Texas law enforcement agency. Geraldo has in his possession, his staff does, uh, an interview with L.H. Williams. We have the spectrographs. We sent it to a second set of experts. It has not been spliced together. The person he's talking to, when the tape was given to me, I was told up front that the person he was talking to, either in some kind of very barbaric duplication process, that voice had been cut out. Now, when we analyzed that tape, and by the way, I... I wait, wait, I wait, wait a second. Why isn't that person heard? When I was presented the tape, Geraldo, this whole story is in the book, I was told that Elvis may have been talking over the telephone in 1981. You can hear the clicks of the person he's talking to. Are you um, saying that it was recorded over the telephone? Yeah. In fact, one of the experts that looked at it... So even audio, the person that interviewed him didn't see him? Um, it seems to be... Now, I've heard... Hold on a minute. It doesn't matter who saw him because I sent it to the experts. They put it through a spectrograph, and I have challenged, and I will challenge you. 
I think if you doubt that that is Elvis Presley, go to your own experts and you can fight it out with the Houston people. Okay. Um, I had two okay. radio stations that did it. Right. Uh, and du they agree. So don't don't mock something unless you don't even believe he's alive yourself. Why write the book? It is not my position. Are you I am for a presenting public you. No, I'm presenting you. I don't even believe Elvis Presley was a big drug addict that was shown on 2020. But that, but you might have. You know what the difference it. is? We had the autopsy reports from the government. We showed them on TV. We had the well, testimonials hey. of eyewitnesses. You don't have a single eyewitness. You don't have any documented proof that would stand up by any the slightest test of journalism not to mention law it's just uh, it seems made out of whole cloth what is what what would it take Geraldo for me to raise the possibility in your mind a, 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 give me a for instance of what I would have to do and maybe I can do it for you you can convince me that the state of Tennessee yeah that the medical examiner in Shelby County that the family dozens and dozens of people both close and far away, both lovers and haters, people with different attitudes, different opinions, different experiences, the whole bunch of them got together and contrived this incredible cover-up. It would be the greatest example of cooperation since the founding of the United Nations. I didn't, I didn't mean to get that carried away. Quickly, the question. I, well, my question's I'm, for me. You won my vote. Do you remember where you were when you found out John died and how did you feel at that moment? Yes, I was up at the on an, on in the Upper West Side at a friend's apartment having dinner, and I had heard that over the radio, and my heart just sank. I just didn't know what else. Tell us more about that in our final segment. We'll be right back. I saw John just six weeks before he was killed, and I was also on the Upper West Side of Manhattan when it happened, and it was just so devastating. I really felt the end of an era. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? Afterwards, I ran home, and I started calling people, and phones were ringing, and I got a call from uh, my girlfriend in London who works for Ringo, and she said, I want the name of the hospital, I want the telephone number, and I said, forget it, he's dead. And she just hung up the phone screaming at saying, what's wrong with your bloody country? And then I called David Bowie's house, and uh, his assistant picked up, and she said, what are you talking about? I said, John's gone. She says, come down here. Don't be alone. Because David Bowie was also doing Elephant Men at the time. And all of us sat at David's apartment. Services have been furnished to the Geraldo Show in exchange for these announcements. Hotel accommodations in New York City provided by the Omni Park Central in Mid-Manhattan near Carnegie Hall, Central Park, and Broadway Theaters. Call 800-THE-OMNI or 212-484-3300. Quickly say something nice about say something nice about Jessica. I think I think Jessica Savage was a victim of the television news business. I think she was a victim of her own insecurities. This book only chronicles those struggles. Thanks everybody. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.